Hello, world. What's up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte, and we are here live at the Build studio in New York City. Our last guest today quit his job and in 2013 founded his company on a genuine passion for fine tailoring, luxurious fabrics, and quality clothing. Now, three years later, 2016, he opened his first retail space in New York City's West Village. Two years after that, 2018, he opened his second. Just to be clear, that's like Six years from Daydream to two New York City locations and growing. He's here tonight to share a little bit of his story. I'm super excited to talk to him. Folks, please join me in welcoming from Jason Scott Clothing. You guessed it, the great Jason Scott. Make some noise. Come on. Jason Scott. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Jason, man, thank you so much for being here, dude. How are you doing? My pleasure. I'm good. Thanks for having me, man. Oh, it's awesome good to be to here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Uh, how is life right now in the world of Jason Scott? You doing all right? Life is good. I'm very comfortable. I'm looking at a guy wearing a very nice hoodie right now. I, too, am very comfortable. I mean, you look very. You look more comfortable than I do, almost. I'm incredibly comfortable. Are you? I, I like rarely that. put my arm up like this. Do you? Okay. But I feel comfortable enough and the freedom to do that. Thanks to this. I like it. Well, that's what we're here for. We're here to provide comfort to people like yourself. I know like, I sound like I'm digging around, but genuinely, this is a really comfortable hoodie, by the way. Thank you. I've Thanks. done an amazing job. We'll give you I, 20 bucks later. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. No, they paid me already. They, um, I, I went, I, no, I was really excited you were coming in, and I had never personally been to your store, and so I had taken a walk down yesterday to experience it for the first time, and uh, I was blown away, man. I'm really excited to talk to you about your whole journey, uh, uh, how these places came to be and why you did it. Let's, let's dial it all the way back. Let's start at the very beginning beginning, uh, founded in 2013, just before you, you founded Jason Scott, what were you doing, man? Where were you working? Because you uh, were... I was working at William Morris. Yeah. So, talent agency. <laughs> now <laughs> WME. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, a little bit of a 180. What were you doing there, man? Uh, I was an agent trainee. So, I started actually pushing a mail cart day one. Yeah, you actually, they always joke about you start in the mail room, but you actually push a mail cart through the hallways in a full suit and tie, buttoned up, fully shaved, handing people their mail. It's awesome, super glamorous, <laughs> so much fun. Yeah, do you miss um, it? Uh, yeah, not even a little bit. Um, a little bit. But it was fun. It was it was a really cool experience. I think it taught me a lot, working at the agency, uh, working my way up. I went from pushing a mail cart to being someone's assistant, uh, and the agent trainee program they basically teach you how to become an agent. Wow. So it's really cool. It's really hands on. They have like monthly meetings where they talk to you about what it takes to become an agent, and then you get kind of a mentor or senior agent that kind of guides you along and gives you an insight onto his or her life, which is really cool. How long were you there, man? That I was there for about a lot four and a half years. Yeah, all right. So, Which is great, yeah. Because here, that just colored in a lot of that story for me, because when I was reading about it, like it said you'd work there, but one of the things you would do is on your lunch breaks, you'd head over to uh, uh, the different, so Barney's, I think, was the one. Yeah. Is, that, is that the one that was So nearby? Barney's is right next to our office yeah. uh, in L.A. So on my lunch break, I would go for, you know, we didn't have a long time, because I would get yelled at if I was away from my desk. For more I can't than believe you were able to minutes. walk away from the desk. I would make sure my boss was in a meeting where he wouldn't have access to his phone. So nice. I, you get, as you work there for longer, not to give any advice to any current assistants, but you get clever, and you get to figure out when you can go to the bathroom, when you can leave, because you really can't leave or go to the bathroom for the nine or ten hours that you're there. Um, but, yeah, I would go to Barney's. On my lunch break, um, <clears throat> I became friendly with the guys in the suiting department, and they knew that I was making you know 30 grand a year. I couldn't afford a, a Brioni or a Catan suit, but they let me try it on. They would talk to me about the fabrics, and that's kind of where I fell in love with tailoring. So you'd put on this $10,000 suit that I shouldn't even be touching, um, but I just I appreciated the fit. I appreciated the fabrics, and they would spend a lot of time with me and walk me through the stuff. They'd show me the new collections as they came in, and that's, I think, where it sort of started, that this passion for, for clothing. Um, and then from there, I was always more of a casual person, um, but I couldn't find anything that I really liked. So I remember one day I went to Barney's on my lunch break and I walked around and I said, if I had an unlimited amount of money, is it, is it a finance thing that I can't afford it or does it not exist? And at the time, it wasn't, it wasn't because I was making 30 grand a year and I couldn't afford it. I was really limited in the fact that there was really nothing that I wanted. Yeah. So at the time, I just, I mean, I kind of just said, fuck it, uh, quit my job. I uh, went to work at a restaurant at night for about two years and then spent two years learning about clothing. I mean, I knew nothing, like nothing at all. How did you the, – oh, there's so much I want to unpack in there. Okay, how did you spend – so two years learning about clothing. You, you decided, fuck it, I got to do this. Yeah. That's a scary thing for anyone to do, especially at you've been building a career. You're there for four years and change. You've climbed this ladder, and now you're like, uh, I can't do this anymore. And that was the craziest thing, because to get into William Morris at the time, I was, I always say like I was the dumbest kid in my class. So basically every month they bring in a new class of kids. Everyone in my class either went to an Ivy League school, had an MBA or a law degree. And I just went to Syracuse, which is a good school, but like school. I'm just a kid from Chicago that went to, I don't have an MBA or I didn't go to Harvard. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to get into. I got very lucky getting in 
to William Morris even to get a job there. Um, and then leaving it was, you know, you spent four and a half years. I was about to get promoted probably in six months to what I've been doing for the last four years. And I just, I just didn't want to do it. I just quit. It was the, you know, best thing I ever did at the time. It was the dumbest thing I ever did. How did you go from hanging out on your lunch break and like, discovering this is a thing you love. Like, what did, what, did you tell your parents? Like, what was all that transitional part? Oh, God, yeah. It's so easy right now for, for, for us to look back and go, well, I quit and I did it and that was it. But, like, that's, like, probably one of the, the scariest and hardest parts for a lot of people watching this or even in this room right now where they, they're they passionate about a thing. Somebody's on their lunch break right now from a job they hate watching this thing. <laughs> and it's like, how do, the, how do you go from just being like, this is what I want to actually making it happen? Like, how did you push through that wall and and just quit and start. So I think for me, the, the kind of the, the rare but exciting thing was there were so many years that, like the people, the guy or girl that you said on their lunch break right now that has a passion for something, they, in their, in their heart, they have a passion for it. When I was first started to fall in love with this, I didn't realize I was doing it. I didn't know I had a passion for this. If you would have told me even 10 years ago, I'd be sitting <clears throat> here talking to you about my clothing line, I'd say you're out of your mind. Yeah. I'd say there's zero chance of that happening. But there were so many things that as I was getting older and I was working at the agency and as I was being more involved in clothing and in fashion that I started to fall in love with it and I was doing it subconsciously. I'd be at a Barney's or a Nordstrom for two or three hours on a weekend and I'd be looking at clothes. I always used to joke that they probably thought I was stealing stuff yeah. because I wouldn't buy anything, but I would be analyzing the, you know, the cuff on here or like, why is this red, this color? It should be a blue or, yeah. and I, I didn't know I was doing it, but in my head for the longest time I was designing the collection and then as it just got to be more and more of like, this is all that I could think about, even during doing this, like this sort of time in my life where I'm spending hours in these stores, I never once thought, this is what I want to do. This is what I should do. Yeah. I was just spending this time in the stores and looking in different products and looking for stuff. And then I, as it got bigger and bigger, I realized that what I wanted to create, what I wanted to make didn't exist. And that's when I said, on a whim, it was a very short period of time where I was like, this is what I want to do. I actually want to do this for a living to quit my job to actually start doing it. I definitely didn't tell my parents. Um, well, yeah, God, no. At some point, they're watching now. Yeah, uh, mom, dad. I, yeah. Out. Yeah. Surprise, I'm not working at William Morris anymore. I live in New York. Um, I kept my 310 number, though, so I could lie to them this whole entire time. <laughs> Yeah, it's the only thing that sucks is I have to stay up late because of the East Coast. You know, yeah, they no, think, there's a mild. Time I mean, difference. it's it's been rough. Yeah, but no, they don't they don't know how to work the internet that well. So, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're not seeing this. If they get but FiOS, it, they're gonna see it, man. We're I know that's right. And if they are watching this, yeah, I, I should. I quit my job. Um, but uh, no, I told them eventually. I think I told my dad first. Um, and my parents are the best. Like, love them to death. The most supportive people in the world. Which for me, without that, I never would be here. So they, I could call my dad tomorrow and say. I want to quit the clothing line and I want to be a, you know, something crazy, a, a painter. Yeah. And I, I'm not a painter. Um, and he would say, what, what can we do to help you? And they were very supportive. Um, they always joke, like, he always wants to help me more, but he can't do anything because he has he doesn't do anything in fashion. Yeah, what did he do? What did your father do? Uh, he's a labor lawyer in Chicago. Yeah, so he's a, he's Great guy, yeah. awesome. Um, but, like, there's not much that he could do to really help me. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't, like, self-funded. Um, couldn't go to him for like a ton of money to start the brand. He couldn't, he didn't have any connections in the industry. But like every time he asked me, like, he's like, how can I help you? I'm like, well, you could have been the president of Barney's. You could have had your own line. You could be Ralph Lauren. Like, you could do something. Um, but he's a great guy. He's been very inspirational for me. So, what about your mom? What did she do when you were growing up? My mom, uh, she was a teacher and then she retired after having kids. And she's the Mother Teresa of all mothers. I mean, my mom does more things. Right now, I guarantee you, it's, was it, it's four o'clock in Chicago. She's running four errands for four different people right now, and I'd be willing to bet the company on that. Um, she just, like, she's the sweetest person ever. She's been so supportive, um, almost a little bit too much at times, where I have to, you know, bring her down a level. Um, but she loves seeing it and seeing the brand, and she gets excited when she calls me, and she's like, I saw someone wearing your hoodie. I'm like, oh, thanks, Mom. Pretty cool. Yeah. Was there anything, like, I know uh, from what I was reading that, and from what you just said, that, like, your parents, nobody was really in design, nobody was in fashion, nobody was in this world. Yeah. But is there something with hindsight you look back, like, did you like to take electronics apart? Like, something that <laughs> indicates that you were the kind of person that was going to appreciate these details and get into this as you got older. For sure. So as a yeah. kid, looking back in my life, I was always building things. So I wanted, so I grew up uh, in Chicago, and it's, it snowed a lot, obviously. So, you know, I had a backyard. I wanted to go snowboarding when I was... God, eight or nine years old. We didn't have a snowboard. My parents wouldn't just go buy me a snowboard. 
So I took a sled. I know. Parents are the worst, man. I mean, come on, guys. Buy this on a snowboard. Um, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of you. I'm wondering what death trap did you concoct to ride down oh, the hill? I know. I what survived. <laughs> I just hit the cast off this morning, actually. But uh, I took two pieces or three pieces of cardboard. I don't even know where the cardboard was from. But I basically took, I, I laid out a, um, a sled. And then I, I taped up on this side and then on this side with a little bit of a a ridge, and I would put my feet in it, and I made myself a snowboard. You made bindings out of cardboard. Out of cardboard, yeah. I mean, Burden should also call yeah. me, too, because yeah, I got exactly. some good ideas. And then I just, I made a hill in the backyard, like a very small one, and I just went down it, and I made myself, I, like, made my own um, snowboard. We would, I would play hockey in my basement with my dad. Same thing. We, you wouldn't just buy me hockey equipment, so I made, uh, like, a blocker, like a goalie blocker, again, out of cardboard. I have this love for cardboard that I'm just realizing as I talk to you. <laughs> Um, which is super weird, by the We're way. We're going to figure out what yeah. role cardboard really plays. I think I need life. to talk to somebody about that because that doesn't make any sense. But, yeah, I would just make stuff. So I made a, a blocker. Um, I, would, I was always making things, but I never, ever thought as a kid that this is what I wanted to do or that I would ever have my own company. Yeah. Um, but I was always a creative trying to find ways to do that. But as a kid, if you ask me if I'm a creative or a business guy, I would always say business-minded. Yeah. And now here I am, creative. Go a, figure. A little bit of business sprinkled on top. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's you a, gotta have both sides. a mix. Yeah. Do you ever, um, as someone who is now, you know, you're building this brand. There's, uh, we're going to talk about some of the incredible people that that have caught on and and are wearing it all over the place. As you've grown in this world and become more of a designer and become someone in the fashion world, have you ever found yourself in in a room because of your unorthodox? or lack of like traditional training? Do you ever feel like out of place in, in, in a room or do you ever feel like an insecurity in the very beginning when you're like, I don't belong here, what am I doing? I have no idea how any of this works. Oh yeah, yeah. all the time. Uh, day one too, like when I first started the brand, I would be talking to people, I had no idea what I was doing when I first started. So one of my favorite stories is I would go to the, I was living in LA at the time when I started the brand, I'd go into a factory and I would say, this is what I wanna make. So they would say, what kind of stitch do you wanna do? Or what kind of thread? I have no idea what the difference is. A nice one. So yeah, well I would say like, well, you know, I'd be like, like what do you think? Like what do you think would look nice? And they would say, let's do let's do cover stitch. Like, yeah, it's awesome. It's great. I fucking love cover stitch. <laughs> I'd get in my car, we can this is yeah. I'd get in my car and then I would Google what cover stitch was and I would say, Oh man, that's not what I want. Oh so I thought it was the most expensive stitch. Oh really no, yeah, they're trying to screw me over. Yeah. <laughs> so the next day I would go back and I would play it up. I'd be like, oh, you know what? Listen, I was thinking about cover stitch, but let's do overlock or let's do single needle. And I would go in there and I would sort of just like act like I knew what I was doing, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I felt out of place all the time. And then even going to trade shows, meeting with buyers. Yeah, it's gotta be um, super intimidating. They're asking me questions. I don't know the answer to Like, what are your deliveries? What do you want them to be? <laughs> like, and, and like, yeah, and your deliveries, you have to make production. Like, it's not an easy thing. So I was just, I mean, I was making stuff up as I went along. I felt out of my element a lot in the beginning um, because I was such an outsider with no fashion background. I didn't know what I was doing in any of these meetings or any of the trade shows or even making production. I mean, the first thing I ever made for production is, is still in a factory in LA. We ruined it because, or I ruined it, I should say. I didn't, it's long story short. I didn't know you had to put zippers on a garment for garment dye after you garment dye the garment. Any fashion person would know this. Any intelligent person would know this. Put the zippers on first, about $8,000 worth of goods got ruined. And I thought I was out of business. And I, I to this day, I still, you know, yeah. it's tough. That's a lesson. I know, I know, yeah, I know. It still stings. It's one of those, yeah. That's amazing. I mean, uh, that kind of answers my what was one of your steepest learning curve moments. Uh, it sounds like you learned a lot in that moment. Uh, something yeah, I was for really sure. curious about, um, you know, as someone who you, you describe your, your origin story, your Batman begins here as like, I designed for what I wanted, what I didn't see. They didn't make what I wanted. And that's kind of like where you began, right? Now, recently you guys launched uh, a women's line. Yes. And so I'm wondering what that was like to work on those designs for clothes that presumably you wouldn't wear. Uh, yeah, uh, and or you could, whatever, man. Nah, just in case my parents were, I do not. Yeah, you know, <laughs> no, this is judgment free, man. <laughs> but I'm just like in my head, I was like, you know, a dude who's designed and come up in the game, designing for himself and what he wears and what he thinks is comfortable. I'm curious what that was like when you're like, all right, let's expand the line. Yeah. How did that work? What What did you learn from that, and how did that go? So the women's line actually came very organically, which was great. So we had a lot of my friends and customers complaining to me because their you know girlfriends and wives were stealing their stuff. Huh. Um, when I started the line, I always envisioned a, a women's line at some point, uh, but I think it came about a little bit sooner because of that. So uh, I sort of thought about who, who would I want our girl to be? You know, who's, or, or, and what's the equivalent of, from the feminine side of the men's brand? So we wanted it to make sense. I wanted it to be very cohesive. We use a lot of the similar fabrics. 
Um, but it was fun to design the women's stuff because when it comes to fashion, women's wear is much more, it's much bigger. They're much more experimental with what they'll wear. Guys were very simple. You'll see me, you know, I'll be wearing this just about every single day. Same color, you know, jeans. I'll, I'll change my Jordans once in a while. But men are very simple when it comes to what they wear. But with women, there's a lot more fun things that you can do in different styles. So it was actually kind of exciting for me to design women's. Um, but because I don't wear this stuff, I worked with our team members um, that are part of the brand, you know, the, the girls that work with us, um, and sort of co-designed it with all of them. And it's been great because we design things that, you know, we want to wear, that they want to wear. And I always ask them every day, I'm like, if you see something on the street that you like or that we don't have, let's design it. Um, or I'll say, you know, why aren't you wearing our pants today? I'm not mad at you for it, but, like, what do you want to see? What pants do you want that we could make? And we do that. Um, it's a fun family environment at the company. Anyone that works with the brand has a, has a say in anything. So whether you're our accountant or you're the head, you know, retail manager or you're a salesperson, uh, you have access to me every day, and you can always sort of come up with new designs. And it's, it's a fun collaborative effort, I think, and especially with the women's side. I wanted to bring in other people and get people's opinion. Um, but women's has been great. It's been taken off. Uh, it's been selling really, really well. We're really excited for the growth of that. That's awesome, man. Yeah, and I got that, a sense of that vibe when I when I stopped by the shop the other day. And I'm curious, you grew up in Chicago, started the business in L.A. Why, why New York? Why did you want to have your brick and mortars here? So for me... Our brand is can be can be pigeonholed as a West Coast brand. We do casual basics. There's a lot of brands out there that are West Coast, a little bit more oversized. But for me, the vision for the brand is much more upscale. It's the guy that's you could wear this sweatshirt alone, or you could wear it underneath like a leather jacket or even a blazer, yeah. um, and make it more elevated. So for me, New York meant made more sense for the brand. Also, what New York represents it's the fashion mecca. Um, it's such a great city. And then from a personal standpoint, I love. LA and it was a great place to live, but I wanted to be closer to Chicago. I wanted to be in a big city. I never lived in New York. The timing was perfect. Yeah. And I just kind of uprooted the company, moved here, uh, started hiring some people and we just, we grew pretty quickly here. Yeah. And that's kind of what I envisioned too. I thought LA would be a little bit harder for us to grow um, because it's more casual. So here it's more suit and tie, but those guys and girls, they like to be comfortable as well. So it's nice for us to offer that uh, here and try to as we try to grow our East Coast and Midwest, uh, you know, our brand on that on that aspect. What uh, I want to go to a second. Uh, let the guys get it ready. There's a picture of somebody in particular who's a big fan. Oh, here we are. Yeah, Perfect. Hey. Thank you, gentlemen. This uh, happened pretty recently, and uh, I want to know the significance of this moment. To not just have a, a loyal customer like Harrison Ford who loves loves your stuff, but it's on the cover of GQ. He's wearing it in a movie. Did you guys? Was there other than that being very cool? Yeah. Was there a tangible spike? Was awareness peaked in that moment? Like, how did that affect you guys? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Awareness definitely spoke. For me, this was one of the coolest things ever. I can remember this like it was yesterday. So basically, if you're ever in a GQ or any magazine, they'll email you beforehand and they'll say, we need credit for this, which basically means what's the style, what's the price point, where is it sold? Yeah. But they don't tell you anything. So they emailed me a month before this came out and they said they need credit for the t-shirt. And they and I just assumed that like, oh, this is awesome. We're going to be in GQ, oh, but it's going to be in the back pages. They don't tell you anything about talent. They don't say Han Solo's so, going to be on the cover. No, 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 God, no, definitely not. Or Indiana Jones. Yeah, Indiana, Indy's going to be. Or Harrison that. Ford. <laughs> Fuck, like. Yeah, he could just be himself. Um, it's equally cool. Yeah. <laughs> or the guy. What? Uh, I forget the one where he, he saves the, on the, the, on the airplane. Yeah, the president. Air yeah. yeah. What was that movie though? Yeah, uh, Air Force One. Air Force One, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. that's embarrassing. Um, so anyway, so I, so they, they tell me this, and I'm like, this is great. I don't think I told anybody either because I didn't know where it was going to be, so I didn't want to get too excited about it. And then I wake up one morning, and I look at my phone, and I've got a few texts, and I've got a few emails from people. And the first email that I see was from a guy over at GQ, and he's like, did you see you know, Instagram? So this is at a time when Instagram was out. So I quickly opened up my phone, and I look at it, I'm like, I'll, I'm sitting at the edge of my couch. I can remember like it was yesterday. I just woke up, and I was like, holy shit. Like, this is awesome. And I think I sat there for a minute, um, and it was cool. It was a very surreal moment. Um, I don't get choked up easily, uh, unless the Cubs won the World Series, where I cried like a you know child. But uh, this was a really cool moment, because this happened organically. So he showed up to set, and they had a whole wardrobe for him. And he goes, no, this is my favorite t-shirt. This is what I want to wear. So I didn't even know. I didn't know you know him at the I didn't know this was going to happen. Um, it was the coolest thing ever, man. And it's been awesome for us. He is the nicest guy ever. He's from Chicago. Um, and now he's just a customer of ours. Like, he'll call, place orders. Um, he's the best. So was this when you told your parents? 
<laughs> this is when I told my parents. Softens the, the blow. The right? coolest thing about this, so one little known fact about the brand is that everything, for the most part, is either named after a family member or named after a Cubs player or a friend or a street in New York when we run out of names. So this is the Raymond Crew, which is my mom's father, who was actually a really big accountant, I think, in New York. Um, and he was, and he never got to see this, you know, come to fruition. But he was a, he was an awesome guy. So it's cool for me to have this on there and have that sort of one other level of of specialness, I guess, if that's a word. That's a, it, it sure is, man. Especially in this context, yeah. that is so freaking surreal. Yeah, it's cool seeing it right now. I mean, it's um, yeah. this is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, well, I had found something uh, in an interview you had done, a and a you had done with uh, the uh, manual in 2014. Oh, that was a ooh. good thing. It was a good thing. Okay. Uh, and so it's 2014 you did this, and they asked you, where do you see the brand in five years? And so I'm paraphrasing your response here, but you said, I hope to grow the brand and expand out distribution. A women's line is in the future, as well as our own brick and mortar stores. Very excited for the future. I'm looking forward to building the brand. So by my count, number one, kudos, you did all that. Thank you. <laughs> you Thank actually achieved a hope for applause. Dude made a five-year plan and did Thank you. That's thank, cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so number two, looking ahead, what, what does the future hold? What's the next five years? What are we looking at uh, now as you look to the future, man? So for us, the next five years, we're looking to continue to grow the brand. Um, retail for us is really important. You saw the store yesterday. Um, I love when people say retail is dead because for me that just means more uh, potential for us. Right. Um, it's To me, it's not dead. People still love to shop. They just want to change the experience. So for us, it's opening up more retail stores. Not a ton, you know, maybe five to ten over the next couple of years um, in key markets for us. And then just growing awareness. Uh, we're about to launch a collaboration with Major League Baseball, which is huge for us. Yeah, which I'm really excited about um, in a couple months, which is going to be big for us. So doing things like that, that makes sense. Obviously, a big baseball fan, a big Cubs fan. Yeah. It's very authentic for us. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of grow the, you know, in, in that sense, grow awareness. Um, but it's, it's fun because I get asked that question a lot. And my honest answer is, you know, I have a five, I have a 10, I have a 15 year plan, obviously, but so much changes so often, yeah. especially in fashion that we kind of have to adapt, um, to see what's going to happen. But I have an idea of where I want to take it. I've got some ideas for future retail stores that I want to have, um, but we're just going to continue to grow the brand and grow the awareness and. You know, go from there. How much of your vision for your retail stores was influenced by those early experiences that you had at Barney's? Because one of the things I noticed when I got in there was just, first of all, everybody was super chill, and the energy was great. But also, too, the, the whole space was kind of designed to, one, experience your product, but also just kind of hang out. There was a coffee bar. There's a whole series, like, couches and a TV and a little mini bar in the back as well. It was just very much a social environment that happened to have your product all around. It was a really interesting experience. Yeah. And I'm just curious where that vibe was born from. So again, that comes from a personal standpoint. Yeah. So for me, I hate going into retail stores. When you walk in, the employees are all over you, or they're really aggressive, or there's 75 different racks, and everything's on sale, and you yeah. can't find your thing. I wanted to create an, a vibe that had a home feeling. Home for me is a very important word. Um, you, you know, you, a stressful day at work, you go home, you unwind, you're, you're just, you're happy, you have a glass of wine or, you know, a glass of scotch. You're very comfortable, you're very relaxed. I wanted the retail experience to emulate that. So when I designed the space, I also had no idea, like no design experience either, but I said, sure, I'll design the store. How hard could this be? It's very difficult. I think I, and then, I joke, but I really did almost die one time, almost fell off a ladder. Wait, what? Yeah, I was, I was, it was midnight. Uh, sorry, mom and dad. Um, again, <laughs> who do watch? Yeah, I know, right. They are watching. They, uh, it was midnight, and we there was like a hole in the ceiling, so I got on the ladder. It's the ceiling's height is about twenty feet. Yeah, it's up there. I got on the giant ladder. It's about twelve thirty at night, and I was cutting into the drywall to expose the hole to see what the leak was coming from, and I almost, almost fell. Jesus. Dude. But breaking news, I didn't, and I'm yeah, okay. You're here. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm alive. Yeah. But it was crazy. But it's like those kind of experiences. I hate to say this, they're fun because. They make, when I hear someone like yourself talk about the store, it makes it feel that much more special because blood, sweat, and tears actually went into building it. Um, but it was important for me to have a place where people can come. And I, obviously, it's a business. We want people to spend money. But that's not our goal. The goal with the store isn't to drive revenue. It's to have a place where people can come in and understand who we are and get the vibe of the brand right off the bat. Um, you know, we've had people want to rent out the space. We've done, we do Pilates every Thursday in the, in the store. Really? Yeah, we did it this morning. <laughs> Huh. Um, every Thursday morning we do Pilates, which is great. So it's like things like that that we do that are fun that are not in your typical retail space. I'm a big against the grain person. So if someone tells me to do one thing, I'll probably do the other thing. 
very cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad when somebody told you to do this, you did it. Because it's been very cool having you here. Thank you. We've got, we've got some audience questions in the room, so I'm going to get to those guys before we run out of time. I've got two. Thank you, Tomas. The first one is coming to me from right over here. Come on down. Hi, I have an online question from buildseries.com. Somebody cool. wants to know, what is the most important lesson you've learned so far in your fashion journey? Oh, God, that's a tough question. Um, but the, I'm going to go with my gut, the first thing that came to my mind. The, the, the biggest lesson in, is don't give up. Um, there were six or seven key moments in doing this that I think any sane person would have walked away. I'm obviously not sane. Um, but I think you're, you're, you can dream something and you can achieve your dream as long as you don't stop. And for me, I knew I was going to make it because I, the, the word quit, the failure was never an option for me. So that to me has been the biggest thing of just no matter how many negatives or how many bad things happen to you, just keep going. Don't ever stop. Can I ask you a follow-up? Thank you for your question, yeah, by the way, person on Thank you, online. thank you. Um, do, what, what, a ladder near-death experience aside, what was the scariest moment? What's the closest you came? You never gave up, yeah. but you're human. Yeah, Crazy yeah. human, but a human no less. What was the scariest moment that you had to navigate? Oof. Yeah. Um, I know we're getting deep. You're going to make me get emotional on TV right now? <laughs> Shit. Uh, scariest moment was when I blew that first production run. And then the second scariest moment, which not a lot of people know, but I'll tell you real quick. Uh, I'm in L.A., driving home. Uh, don't have a lot of money at this time. And I will get kind of choked up talking about this because it's crazy to think about it. But I get in my car, and I, had, I was out of gas. I had zero gas. Drive from downtown L.A. to where I live was maybe a 20, 30-minute drive. You need to have gas in your car. I knew I was broke at this time. It was 7 o'clock at night. I had no money. I had no cash. All my credit cards were maxed out because I was putting everything on a credit card. And I get in my car, and I say, oh, shit, what do I do? Couldn't call my friends because it was in downtown LA. I also, from a personal standpoint, it was embarrassing. I had no money. I couldn't call my parents because they were in Chicago. And they also, they're not super wealthy people. They couldn't really help me. Um, and I thought I was going to be stranded in downtown LA. So I pull in the gas station. And I can remember this, like again, like it was yesterday. I get outside. I'm not a big prayer type person, but I was like, please just let this work. I take out my debit card, which I know I had 50 cents on. I put it in the machine. I did it as credit. And I just like, again, I closed my eyes. And I was like, please work. And thank God it worked. And I was able to get home. And that was that to me was probably the lowest of the low because that was in the beginning of it. But I, I had zero money. I was no, broke. No. And at that point, any reasonable person would have just said, you know what? I need to get a job. I need to do this. Um, and that was tough. That night, I didn't like I'm fine now. But like that night, I, yeah. I didn't eat. I had to wait till the next weekend to get some cash and to sell some clothes. And it was tough. And there's a lot of stories like that. That were tough. I well, one thank you very much for sharing that, and I appreciate uh, your candor. And I, I only ask it not not to be a dick, but like and make you relive these tough moments, but because sincerely, for people, they don't hear that side of the journey that often. And I think that can be a very helpful story for a lot of people to know that that's part of it. And that it, yeah, I, I tell in the intro, oh, in six years you went from having a dream to having a store, but it's like yeah. there's so much that transpired in that time. Uh, and so I appreciate you sharing that and, and opening up with that. Thank you. There are so many things that happen along the way. We've got um, uh, time for one more question. Let's go for it right here. Hey, Jason. Thank so, you buddy. for being here. In today's ever-changing fashion market, what is some advice you would give somebody who wants to create their own brand? So my best advice for you or for anyone listening is stay true to yourself. Um, so fashion trends are going to come and go. Whatever you want to make, uh, I love your jacket, by the way. And if you're a leather jacket person and you think that you can make a better leather jacket, but the fashion world, the market is going away from a leather jacket or a faux leather jacket, and they're going more into suiting. If that's your passion, just stick with it. Because if you try to do something that isn't your passion or isn't something that you love, it's going to show. And for me, the clothes, like I don't wear anything on the men's side. Or I don't design anything that I wouldn't personally wear. And there's a certain authenticity, I think, to the brand that I really do believe in it because I'm designing it for myself. And it's the same advice I would give to someone, whatever they want to design, whatever they want to make, just really, really believe in it and be passionate about it because if you're not, it's going to show in the design, it's going to show in the product, and it's going to show when you're talking about it to your friends. I, I literally, and I hate the word literally, but I live and breathe this, and I love it. And that's why I get kind of choked up when I talk about it because it's so special. I mean, this brand means the world to me. Um, and I think if you have that passion, you'll have success. Thank you. My pleasure. And good luck. Thank you, guys. I, well, I want to thank everyone, uh, especially Jason's parents, for watching at home. And I want to uh, thank our audience as here right now. You guys are great, and you had wonderful questions. Uh, if you haven't checked it out already, you're crazy. Go to jasonscottclothing.com. Uh, what else do you want to tell people? Keep an eye out for the MLB partnership. What MLB is launching soon. Uh, come by and have a scotch, whiskey, spread the word. Our stuff is really soft, so it's not weird if you want to, like, rub my shoulder afterwards. Um, <laughs> 
There you go. You heard the man. Open Super invitation. And that's soul. how I lost the brand. That, that was the exact moment. So close. And your parents just Sorry. found out about it. Hopefully they saw All right. Uh, we got to wrap things up. Everybody, please put your hands together. Make a ridiculous amount of noise. Thank the great Jason Scott for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.